Welcome to the Highland Church of Christ online service. We'd like to invite you to put away all distractions and join us in a song. Father, we come before you, we praise you, and we thank you so much for the beautiful day of life that you've given us. We thank you for the many blessings that we enjoy. We thank you for the many good things that you give us day in and day out. We pray that we will always remember those things and, and always give you the glory. We pray for those that we know of who are sick. We ask that you would restore their health if it be according to your will. 
We pray for those who are struggling in so many ways, those who are struggling with addiction, with financial concerns, with marriage issues. We pray for them and pray that they would seek your counsel that is provided in your word so that they might live according to your will. We pray for those who are struggling in other countries and those around the world who are seeking you. We pray that they would be able to find your word and and to obey it and become your sons and daughters. Father, we ask that you bless us as we continue on throughout our day and throughout our life. And we ask that you forgive us of our sins. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I find it interesting that in John 13 and all the gospel accounts, when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, that he's doing so around a meal. Obviously, it's called a supper, but it's a, it's a meal. And he does so around the Passover meal. And the interesting thing about it is, is that Jesus, as we all know, is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings, the King of all creations. Jesus is right here. And he's gathered around this table with his disciples at a meal. And he institutes this, this, this memorial feast, the Lord's Supper. The, we, we take this every single week to remember the Lord's death, of course. Remember what God has done for us through Jesus, and rightly so. And so we too, much like Mephibosheth, we get to gather around the Lord's table. We get to eat at the Lord's table every single week. We get to gather at the King's table every single week when we take communion. So let's keep that in mind today as we, as we pray together and as we take this communion. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our king and thank you for making it possible for us to be in your presence and thank you for allowing us to eat at your table. Help us to remember who you are. Help us remember what you are. and Help us to remember the foremost place that you are to take in our hearts and our lives and we are to enthrone you as king of our lives and king of our hearts. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You know, as we gather around the king's table, part of this, of course, is that we uh, remember what the king did through his blood. Let's pray about this as we take this cup. Lord Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for the opportunity to remember that each and every week. Lord, help us to remember that you are to be the king of our lives. And in part, you have that right because you have paid the price for our sins. Thank you so much for all that that entails and all that it means to us, and help us to remember those very things. It's in your name. Amen.
Now, one of the things we think about when we think about a king is someone who has typically a lot of power and uh, usually an immense amount of wealth. When we discuss that and we think about a kingdom and a king, those are kind of things that come to mind, do they not? Power, money, wealth, influence, those sorts of things. Uh, when we look back at the example of David and Mephibosheth earlier, David could clearly afford to feed Mephibosheth. He could clearly afford to give back those things to him and his family and let him have all of those things. And and one of the things about it that I find so interesting is that kings, such as in the example of David there, uh, he was willing to share what he had, but David would really have never fully given all of that up, which that's one of the things that I think makes Jesus and his kingship so unique is the fact that Jesus, as we know here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul makes this, makes this argument about Jesus. He says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, like a king, right? Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Who does that? Who would give up every single thing they had so that we, in turn, might become rich, might enjoy their riches, might enjoy what they have. And that's very much what Jesus has done. And when we think about that in light of our giving, what are we really giving up to God? What what are our riches, so to speak? What of our wealth? What of our money? And those kind of things are we really giving up for God? Those are the kind of things we need to think about. Not just that we're passing the collection plate, not just, yes, I know that that God's work, it, it has to be funded, of course, yes. But what are we really giving up for God? Are we, are we willing to become poor that others might become rich like that or that others might be able to experience the riches of Christ? Because this is very much the things that we're trying to do every single time that we give, every single time that we, we contribute to the work of the Lord's church. We are ensuring that other people can enjoy the riches of Christ, that other people can experience that fact that Jesus, though he was rich, gave up everything so that through his poverty, we too could become rich. That's amazing, is it not? Let, let's, let's pray about this. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving up everything you had, the unimaginable, unfathomable riches of heaven that you gave up, so that you could come to earth and that you could die on our behalf. We are so grateful for that, Lord, and in light of that, I just pray and ask, Lord, that you'll help us each to search our hearts and our minds and think about what it is we're really giving up for you when we give back a portion to you through our contribution each week. Lord, bless us as we do this, but also, God, we pray that your work will abound and your word will be spread. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good evening. Uh, let's turn in our Bibles together to John chapter 3 tonight. That'll be our home base of study together. John chapter 3. Can we just take a minute and just say how awesome it is when all of our youth groups are together? There may be nothing more encouraging that we could experience in a worship assembly than for all of the youth groups in an area to get together, to sing songs together. It is so good for that to happen, for them to worship with each other. And not just that, but for the entire church to be able to behold that and to be encouraged by it. I'm just, uh, I'm happy to be just a small part of that here tonight. And I'm thankful for all of you and your presence. Let's worship God through his word. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For the area-wise here uh, in this area, uh, you are uh, concentrating on encounters with Jesus. And so our encounter tonight is one of the most famous found in any of the gospel accounts. It's here in John chapter 3. And, and when you look at that text, and I highlighted it for you in the slide previous, when you look at that text and you see these two words together, born again, this encounter, make no mistake about it, is about the reality of a brand new start in a person's life from a power source that does not come from within you. It's a very vital text in the life of Jesus. And I'm wondering how many of you have heard this phrase before. Many of you who grew up in the church, you've heard this phrase many, many times. Or have you actually stopped to think about what does this phrase mean? How would we define it? I think when we think about the words born again, you know, we understand the words being born. That's one of life's greatest, I think, joys is when a baby is born into a family and you have this brand new addition and it's, it's such an amazing thing when you, you have a family that's expanding and man, sometimes there's you know, all these kinds of different dynamics that take place when new children are being born into a family. I'll never forget years ago, uh, my oldest daughter, she was about to have uh, a birthday. We, coming up, you know, we were talking about it for months ahead of time. You know, Hannah, what do you, what do you want for your birthday? And there was only one thing she had on her list. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, she, she made sure we knew about it every time we had a conversation about her, her birthday coming up. I want a puppy. Didn't have one. She wanted a puppy. She wanted a dog she could call her own. Uh, and that's all she, she wanted. Well, leading up to her birthday, we also discovered that she was going to have a baby sister. And so we were planning her party. We are actually planning her birthday party. And I'll never forget this conversation. You know, we were talking about, you know, I just want to make sure you still, you know, what do you want for your birthday? I want a puppy. And I thought, you know, this will be a good moment to reveal to her, listen, I've got some great news for you. You are also going to have a brand new baby sister. And I will never forget her response. It's as clear today as the day she said it. She said, listen, that's great and all, but the only thing I really want is a puppy. <laughs> that's it. That's all she was interested in. And she got the puppy. She got the puppy, named it Scooby-Doo. It was awesome. She loved the puppy. She also got the baby sister. And this baby sister has pushed every button that she could possibly push for the last 13 years. And that's a, you know, a relationship that's just ongoing as they grow. We all understand the dynamics of family. We all understand the dynamics of being born into a family and what that means. A birth we get. A new birth is a little mysterious. And I want to say about these words, being born again, uh, this type of phrase is not as well known as maybe it used to be out in the culture. And I'm not going to say necessarily that's, that might not be a bad thing because of how culture has kind of twisted the phrase born again over the years. 
When I was growing up, there was a litany, I mean just a parade of these cartoonish, televangelist type preachers. You could turn on your television on, on any given Sunday and you could see these guys slapping people's foreheads and healing them. And they're throwing around this language of being born again as Christians and never really defining it. And, and there was something about that time span, there was something about that era in which I grew up where people understood this phrase, born again Christian, as not always a positive title. And so when you think about that, being born again in our culture sometimes has taken on a negative connotation. Not everybody that would be called a, a born again Christian could be said to be a very hard thinking, studying Christian. I was at... Uh, Starbucks not too long ago, and uh, this, this became very apparent. I was actually sitting there, I was on, on the internet, and I was uh, looking through, uh, you know, in the middle of Tennessee, we have, you know, I, I grew up about an hour south of Nashville, and in the middle of Tennessee, the largest news source that we have is the Tennessean. And you can actually get on the Tennessean, the website, and you can search their database. And I actually was Googling and searching on their database the phrase, born again. And what I discovered was that this phrase was not only used for sort of this cartoonish caricature idea of what a Christian should not be, but that there were all these articles and news stories about these individuals who at one time were actors and they were athletes and they were musicians and they had lived lives filled with all kinds of sinful activities and then their life had been rocked by some kind of scandal. And on the other side of that scandal, they had a radical emotional conversion. And from that point forward, they became very strict moral people. The vast majority of articles and news stories from the Tennessean about being born again had to do with that kind of idea. People who got religion. People who were thought to have a weakness in their character, and so they needed a crutch for their lives. And that's how that phrase was being used. A born-again Christian, somebody who can't handle life on their own. And so they need to get religion. So there I am in Starbucks, and I'm Googling all this information, finding out all these news stories about how that's how the title's normally been used. You'll never believe it. Lo and behold, there's these three ladies sitting at a table over for me. I never go to Starbucks. and This is all happening at once. And these three ladies are talking about a friend they had and how she no longer goes to their parties and how she no, no longer hangs out with them. They don't go places together anymore. And she broke up with her boyfriend all because one of them said she's become a Christian. One of those, here's what she said, one of those born-again people. And she used the phrase. I couldn't believe it. She used the phrase, and it was in a derogatory way. So as we approach the text, we've got some cultural baggage. Because on the one hand, there has been in the past sort of this cartoonish idea of what a person is like when they are a born-again Christian. And on the other hand, there are all these stories of these people who lived lives filled with, with sin, hedonistic lives, and then they converted to strict moralism. And I want to pause right now. If I've lost you, come back to me. Hear, hear what I'm about to ask you. Who invented the phrase, born again? We just read it. Who was it? Jesus. And to whom did he say it? Did he say it to either of these categories? Well, the weird thing about it is the person to whom Jesus says, you need to be born again, was the most spiritual and elite people of his day, the Pharisees. One of these individuals who comes to talk to him. And the crazy thing about it is these people are saturated in Scripture. They have a high view of Torah. They memorized it. They lived their lives by it. They wanted to be scholars of it. And they highly prized, especially, purity laws. And this is your person to whom Jesus says, you need a fresh start. You need a, a new beginning. 
These are people who had memorized the Torah. These are people who, listen, multiple times a day, at set times during the day, they would pray over and over and over again. They had dedicated their lives to God's Word. That's astonishing that this is the guy that Jesus comes to and says, you need to be born again. So time out. Think about it. Does this guy fit either of our stereotypes? Is he a cartoonish, feelings-based Christian? Or is he some, what the world might call, a weak person who needs a crutch in life and moves from scandal to moralism? This guy doesn't fit either of those stereotypes. Nicodemus would have been somebody who was wealthy. He was a professor of the Bible for his day. He was an elite member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. He had status in the community. If there was ever anybody amongst God's people who was popular, who knew God's word, and who was moral, it's this guy. So whatever Jesus means by being born again, I think we need to tread carefully. So let's, let's go back to the text. Look in your verse 2 and notice what it says about him. It says that this man came to Jesus at night. And I just want to pause here and, and ask a couple of questions which the text never really answers for us. Why does he come to Jesus at night? We can speculate about it. We might say that maybe because of the controversial nature of who Jesus was, maybe he did not want to be associated with Jesus. Didn't want to be seen talking to him. Maybe he just didn't want to be interrupted because Jesus was, was highly popular and there were people around him all the time. I don't want to discount this idea. Everybody listen to me for just a second. The Gospel of John, the Gospel of John has a very strong theme, a, a motif about light and dark. Hear me out for a second. Have you ever known somebody in your life that you might say about them, man, they're just in the dark about some things. You ever known that person? Maybe you, are, maybe you are that person in your family. I don't know. This is a motif that John has. There are people who are in the dark and they don't get it. And there are some people who are in the light and they understand the truth. And I don't know how much of any of that feeds into this. I think something up here on the screen has to be the case when it comes to this man coming to Jesus by night. He's in the dark. What's led to him coming to Jesus? Have you got your Bible open? You probably might not even have to go back that far. Maybe not even turn a page. If you look back in John chapter 2, you'll notice beginning in verse 13 that Jesus becomes angry. And Jesus walks into the temple complex and he begins to overturn tables. And he begins to kick people out. Who are the people he's kicking out? He's kicking out Pharisees. Time out. You do not separate people from their money unless they can do nothing to stop you. Jesus tears through the temple and he overturns all of these tables and he makes a declaration about it. What does he say? You have made my father's house a den of thieves. And in saying that... Not only was he condemning the Pharisees, hear me out, he was also saying, I'm the heir of the temple. This is my house. He's claiming ownership. So when this man Nicodemus comes by night, I think there's a lot of stuff going on. He comes at night. Maybe he's in the dark, so to speak. But I also think he's coming in direct response to this overt political move where Jesus has just cleansed the temple. Go back to your verse 2. Notice what your text says. He says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are, watch the word, a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you're doing unless God is with him. Can you read between the lines a little bit? He calls Jesus... Rabbi, he calls him a teacher, and maybe on some level, there's some backroom politics going on. Just think about it for just, just hear me out for a second. Jesus, you're a teacher, 
I'm a teacher. You're a follower. You have many followers. I have many followers. Maybe, maybe we can help each other out. We need to have a conversation. I don't think necessarily this man comes as an honest seeker. I think maybe he's coming because there's been something that's happened that's upset his group. And so what does Jesus do in reply? Does Jesus say a word to him about, oh, welcome, I'm glad you're here. We need to have a conversation. Thank you for calling me. A t- I, actually, I am a teacher come from God. Does Jesus do any of that? No, he challenges the guy right out of the gate. In your Bible, are you looking at your verse 3? What are the first two words? It's the same word, but what are the first two words in your translation that Jesus says in verse 3? Up on the screen, I have them highlighted from the ESV. Truly, truly. When I was, I I grew up an only child. Uh, And my cousin was also an only child. And she was like my sister. And we had this ongoing debate about a word that we heard in church every Sunday. How to say it right. And so let's do just an internal little test here, okay? And I'm going to figure out who's right and who's wrong, okay? When, when a prayer ends, how does it go? In Jesus' name, amen. Oh. See, is it amen or is it amen? <laughs> and when I was a kid, my cousin... Absolutely. Stood on the ground of, uh, of amen. She believed it was amen. And I believed it was amen. And we believed this was a good reason to have an argument about it any time that we could. Actually, neither is correct. It's aman. And it is the Hebrew word for belief and trust. It's found in one of the most important texts in the entire Hebrew Bible, Genesis 15, 6, where it says that Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That word for believe is the word aman or amen. It means trust this. So, look at your Bible, verse 3. When Jesus says something to Nicodemus, the first thing he says is, you need to believe this. You must believe what I'm about to tell you. And then what does he tell him? Unless one is, here's our phrase, born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Can, I, can we just take a time out? Are you with me? What a blow to this guy. Jesus is not interested in pleasantries. Jesus is not interested in making friends right here. Jesus goes for the jugular. And I want you to notice this word, born again. In the Greek text, it is one word. It is, say this word in your, your brain to yourself. You can say it. Anothen. Anothen. Are you looking in your verse? Look at verse 3. Where it says born again, do you have a little letter or number that takes you to a reference column with an alternate translation? If you've got a good reference Bible, it'll do it. And that what you'll notice there is there's an alternate way to translate the words born again. And you know what it is? From above. That's what some of your little notes will say. Now, look in your verse 31 of the same chapter, John chapter 3, verse 31, and you will see this exact same word, and now it's not translated born again. It says, he who comes from above, anothen, is above all. Same word, same word, exact. So, so, you ever notice how words can have double meanings? Any of you got one of these at your house? I, I function every day off of a chair drobe, okay? I, I, I'm, I'm just terrible. I'm sloppy. I, I will take a shirt and I'll just, I'm, 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 I didn't get it dirty. I'm going to wear it again in a couple of t- It's terrible. Okay, I got my guy back here. He's shaking his head yes. I'm not the only one in the crowd, okay? Chair drobe. That's a made up word if I ever heard one. Language is funny. What about this word? Text pectation. Where you are waiting anxiously for somebody to text you back. Okay? It's just a made up word. What about this one? Malvin Sanders is the master of the afterclap. If you've been around him at all for any amount of time and there's some kind of celebration for somebody, he's going to be the guy 
after everybody else stopped clapping, he's going to give those two really loud, obnoxious ending claps, just to be funny. Words are interesting. Sometimes words have double meanings, double meanings. And I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. Jesus is brilliant, and he means both meanings when he's talking to this man. He is saying, unless you are born from above all over again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Very powerful. And so what this guy doesn't get is that his life needs to start over and that he cannot rely on his status. He cannot rely on who he's been as a person of faith up to that point. He needs new power to start over. It comes from above. Are you listening? He has no idea that that power is standing right there in front of him. And so notice what happens. Nicodemus says, you're verse 4. Okay, I'll play the game. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Pause a minute. Do you think this guy's really confused? We've already talked about the fact he's got the Torah memorized. He's a Bible professor. I don't think he's confused at all. Jesus is saying to this man, everything you've thought about your faith so far is incomplete. There's something new that's arriving right now. And it's a power source from above that helps you to start over. And this man is saying, in a, you know, essentially, we could help each other. Why do you think I need to start over? That would be like me trying to go back into my mother's womb a second time and be born. I think he's making an argument. It reminds me of later on when Jesus has other arguments with this same group. Matthew 21, verse 31. There's a moment where Jesus looks at this same group and he says to them, listen to this, the tax collectors, who by the way had their own category of being a sinner, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you Pharisees. And Jesus was rough with these guys. So here's this guy, Nicodemus. His life's working out just fine. He has status. He has wealth. He has position. He's probably grown up his whole life in church. It's really hard for him to see his need. Can I pause a minute and just ask all of us in the room? Did you grow up in church? I did. And I will tell you, honestly, it took me till I was about 28 to realize that I needed a different source for starting my life over. It can be a very difficult thing when you've been around church your whole life and you grew up with Bible stories and somehow or another it just doesn't sink in that the way you have a new beginning is through a source from above. And I just want to think about that as the conversation unfolds because now Jesus, as Nicodemus is playing back with him, now Jesus goes a little deeper because he shifts the language. Notice your verse 5. What does he say? Truly, truly, here we go again. You've got to believe this. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot, watch it, enter the kingdom of God. This man thinks that he's already in. Now, Jesus, all right, y'all track, stay with me for a second, okay? What Jesus is about to do is he's about, about, in the rest of this story, he's about to bring up three incredibly powerful allusions to something back in the Old Testament. And it's going to make everything clear. So when he uses this language of water and spirit, there are all kinds of texts back in the Old Testament especially in a passage like Ezekiel 36, listen to this, where there was a prediction that God at one time in the future would send his presence into the world and it would cleanse the land. In fact, the foundations of the temple would be broken open and living water would flow from that and cleanse everyone. He's using this imagery that this Bible professor should know. And that when that time came, they would have new hearts. And they would think differently. And I want to say to you that at this time, there was a man going around who was tying together this 
water cleansing imagery from the Old Testament. He was a guy by the name of John the Baptist, whom the Pharisees rejected. But if you'll look down in your verse 22 of this same chapter, you'll notice that Jesus and his disciples are going around the countryside, remaining in places and baptizing people. They're tying together this cleansing imagery in this practice of baptism where a new beginning can actually happen. And so that new beginning brings a new heart and all the things that you used to love to do now, they just make you miserable. And sin's not fun anymore because you know you're breaking the heart of the God who's done so much for you. So we go back to verse 6. Go back to our conversation for a moment. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is for everyone who's born of the Spirit. Once again, Jesus takes some blockbuster imagery from the Old Testament. This, by the way, would make probably the scariest movie you've ever seen. It's this text back in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37, right after the one he just referred to in Ezekiel 36. So it makes sense in the text. But it's this imagery where the prophet is told, he sees this valley just full of all of these dusty, dry bones. They're all dead. And he, he's told, can, can these bones live? And the wind blows. And the power of God takes hold through the Word of God. And all of a sudden, the bones start to grow muscle. and Could you imagine they made a movie about that now? Muscle and sinew and these people start to form and they start to stand up. They're being renewed. They're almost being reborn. And Jesus is saying, you can see the wind, but you don't know where it comes from. You can see its effect. You don't know where it's going. You've got to trust that God can do it. And so here is Jesus talking to this guy, having this encounter with him and saying to him, you need a fresh start, a new source from above. And look at your verse 9. What's his reply? How can these things ever really happen? You ever ask that in your own life? How could God ever help me? Notice what Jesus' reply is in verse 10. He says, now, hey, do y'all remember this? Do y'all remember, what did Nicodemus say when he came to Jesus? Rabbi, we know that you are a what? Teacher. Notice verse 10. He says, are you really the teacher of Israel? And you don't understand all of these Old Testament references I'm throwing at you right now? Man, Jesus is in his face. And so then, just as, just as he had said, we know you're a teacher, now Jesus says in verse 11... We, I think he means me and my disciples, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen. And what is that in particular? Look at your verse 12. He says, if I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, we're just talking about the ABCs here, then how, how could you ever believe if I told you about heavenly things? And then in verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descends from heaven, the Son of Man. All right. I mean, there's so much we could unpack here, but let me just summarize this. Listen to me. Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, I am giving you the source of your new beginning. You don't realize it, but I've come from somewhere that you have never been. I, verse 13, am the one who has descended from heaven, and therefore I'm the one who has the right to tell you what heaven wants. And now the last Old Testament reference. Look at your verse 14. It's one of the strangest, craziest stories in the Bible. It's a story about a time in Moses, Moses' history, where the people were all encamped, and these weird snakes slithered into camp and started biting people. They became infected, and they started dying off. And Moses was instructed to craft a serpent made of bronze and elevate it on a pole. And so verse 14, Jesus references that and says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. 
This is powerful, powerful imagery. There's a new serpent. So when we think of that in our, in our own lives, Jesus has taken for me and for you the transgressions that you and I could never pay for on our own. As the great prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, 5, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. What you and I have done, Jesus voluntarily took it upon himself. And so that brings us now to our last verse. It's in your verse 16. Do you know this verse? Of course you do. Verse 16. For God so loved the world. Hutos means in this way, God loved the world. What way was that? What way did he love the world? He gave. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's your new source. This is my mama's car. When I was growing up, I thought it was the coolest car ever. At the time, it was just a normal car in the 1970s. Man, that makes me feel old in this room to say that when I was a little kid. I was very young, by the way. But I'm bringing this up for a reason. This is my mom's Chevy Malibu. It was a cool car, man. I love to hang out. This is back in the days when we didn't even hardly use seat belts. Can you believe that? We had no, no nothing on the dash was dinging because I wasn't in my seat belt, you know. I, I lived. It was unreal. And I used to just climb all over this thing about, you know, five years old. I would just be all over this vehicle. I remember one time my aunt came over and uh, we were getting ready to go someplace for whatever reason, she did not know. She thought I was in the back seat. And so she was getting in the passenger side. And unknown to her, she didn't even notice it, I was hanging on to the door from the outside. How she didn't see me, I have no idea. But she did not see me. And she took the car door. You know what she did? She slammed the car door. Guess what was in it? My fingers, <laughs> I can still feel it now. I mean, it was a stinging type of pain. You ever had a finger crushed? Or... Man, I, I, can re I don't remember a whole lot from when I was little. I remember that. And I remember my mom coming over to me. I remember my aunt just apologizing profusely. And I, I remember my mom coming over to me and saying, it'll be okay. You know, she's trying to blow on the fingers so they wouldn't hurt so much. And... I remember looking at my mama and saying, it just hurts so bad. And I remember her saying to me, I know, and if I could take it for you, I would. I don't know why that stuck with me. You know when I really thought about it again? About, I don't know, four or five years ago, my oldest daughter, the one from the beginning with the puppy, she was out in the church parking lot playing soccer with some friends in the church parking lot, plants with this leg to kick. And when she did, the plant leg folded. And here she is laying out on a cold November day on concrete, saying, it hurts. And I told her, I know it does. And if I could take it for you, I would. And you know what? I meant it. And any good parent would mean that. There is a parent who can take it and did take it. There is a God, a Heavenly Father, who chose through His Son to take every pain, every hurt, every injustice, and yes, every source of guilt and wrongdoing into himself for my sake and for your sake. This is the source Nicodemus never knew until this moment. And I'm here to tell you it's the source every single one of us in this room needs. And I will also add to it that the Bible says when he took that pain, he rejoiced to take it. 
He sang a song indicating that he wanted to do it. So here is Nicodemus and Jesus as we close. And Jesus is essentially saying, Nicodemus, you don't need me in your group. You need me. You need a fresh start. You need a new source who can save you, who can take everything you can't do by your status, by your reliance upon the law. You need me. You need somebody who can absorb into himself the inadequacies, the places where you have not been perfect. You need a bronze serpent to heal you, Nicodemus, I, Jesus, am that bronze serpent. And so how does Nicodemus respond? Are you looking in your text after verse 16? What does it say? It says nothing. <laughs> we don't know. Technically, we don't know. We're never given the end of the story. It's so frustrating. But it's also one of those things where are you, are you realizing that as we're watching this encounter unfold, we're also meant to kind of put ourselves in the place of Nicodemus to some extent. And it's left open-ended. Later on in the book of John, Nicodemus is going to be with his very elite group and you know, they're going to be talking bad about Jesus and, Jesus and Nicodemus is going to take this moment and say, hey, hang on a minute, isn't it fair according to our law to actually hear the guy out? And then after Jesus dies... Guess who's there to help bury the body before the resurrection? This man. So I just want to ask, what about you? These encounters are not just about these individuals. They're about us because they bring us face to face with our own need. Do you realize your own need? And so I just want to go back as we close to this John 3.16 verse a verse we've all probably memorized or heard our whole lives. For God loved the world in this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When I was growing up, I always heard the verse this way. I always heard the verse this way. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I think... I think that puts the emphasis in the wrong spot. Because when you think about this conversation, here's how the verse should be read. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish. Whoever believes in Jesus instead of in Himself, in His own status, His own upbringing, His own familiarity. Is that you? Is your trust in Jesus rather than yourself? The way you get it is by being stunned by what God has done for you, by being overwhelmed by the work of Jesus on the cross for each and every one of us. And as we stand here tonight to sing a song of invitation, do you need a fresh start? That'll happen in the waters of baptism for anyone who will come to the right source. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take.